well, now I've done this terrible thing to you. I've introduced a very complicated thing, assignment, which destroys most of the interesting mathematical properties of our programs. Okay. Why should I have done this? What possible good could this do? Yeah, it's clearly not, not a nice thing. So I better have a good excuse. Well, let's do a little bit of playing, first of all, with some very interesting programs that have assignment. To understand something special about them that makes them somewhat valuable. Okay. Start with a very simple program, which I'm going to call make counter. I'm going to define. Make counter. <laughs> to be a procedure of one argument n, which returns as its value a procedure of no arguments. So it's a procedure that produces a procedure, which sets n <coughs> to the increment of n. and returns that value of n. Okay. Now we're going to investigate the behavior of this. It's a sort of an interesting thing. And in order to investigate the behavior, I have to make an environment model. Because we can't understand this any other way. So let's just do that. We start out with some sort of, let's say there's a global environment that the machine is born with. Global, we'll call it. And it's going to have in it a bunch of initial things. We all know what it's got. It's got things in it like, like say, plus, and times, and quotient, and difference, and car, and etc. Lots of things. I don't know what they are. Some various squiggles that are the things the machine is born with. And by doing the definition here, what I plan to do, well, what am I doing? I'm doing this relative to the global environment. So here's my environment pointer. In order to do that, I have to evaluate this lambda expression. That means I make a procedure object. So I'm going to make a procedure object here. And the procedure object has as the place it's defined the global environment. The procedure object contains some code that represents a procedure of one argument n, which returns a procedure of no arguments, which does something. Hmm? And the define is a way of changing this environment so that I now add to it make counter. A special rule for the special thing definite define. But what that is, is it gives me that pointer to that procedure. So now the global environment contains make counter as well. Now, we're going to do some operations. I'm going to use this to make some counters. We'll see what a counter is. So let's define. C1 to be a counter beginning at 0. Of 0. Well, we know how to do this now, according to the model. I have to evaluate the expression make counter in the global environment. Make counter of 0. Well, I look up make counter and see that it's a procedure. Okay. I'm going to have to apply that procedure. The way I apply the procedure is by constructing a frame. Right? So I construct a frame which has, has a value for n in it, which is 0. And the parent environment is the one which is the environment of definition of make counter. OK? 
Okay? So I've made an environment by applying make counter to 0. Now I have to evaluate the body of make counter, which is this lambda expression, in that environment. Well, evaluating this body, this body is a lambda expression. Evaluating a lambda expression means make a procedure object. So I'm going to make a procedure object. And that procedure object has the environment it was defined in being that, where n was defined to be 0. And it has some code, which is the procedure of no arguments, which does something, that sets something, and does a red, returns n. And this thing is going to be the object, which in the global environment will have the name c1. So we construct a name here, C1, and say that equals that. Now if I also make another counter, C2 to be make counter say starting with 10, then I do essentially the same thing. I, can st- I apply the make counter procedure, which I got from here, to make another frame with n being 10. Okay, that frame has the global environment as its parent. I then construct a procedure which has that as its frame of definition, which is the code of it is the procedure of no arguments, which does something, which does a set and so on, and n comes out, okay? And c2 is this. Well, you're already beginning to see something fairly interesting. There are two n's here. They're not one n. Each time I called make counter, I made another instance of n. These are distinct and separate from each other. Now let's do some execution. Use those counters. I'm going to use those counters. Well, what happens if I say C1 at this point? Well, I go over here and I say, oh yes, C1 is a procedure. I'm going to call this procedure on no arguments. But it has no parameters. That's right. What's its body? We'll have to look over here because I didn't write it down. It said, set n to 1 plus n and return n. Okay, increment n. Well, the n it sees is this one. So I increment that n. That becomes 1. And I return the value 1. Okay. Supposing I then call c2. Well, what do I do? I see C2 is this procedure which does the same thing, but here's the n. It becomes 11. And so I have an 11, which is the value. I then can say, let's try C1 again. Hmm, C1 is this. That's 2. So the answer is 2. And C2 gives me a 12 by the same method. By walking down here, looking at that, and saying, here's the n I'm incrementing. So what I have are computational objects. There are two counters, each with its own independent local state. Now let's talk about this a little. This is a strange thing. What's an object? It's not at all obvious what an object is. We like to think about objects because it's economical to think that way. It's in an intellectual economy. I am an object. You are an object. 
We are not the same object. I can divide the world into two parts, me and you, and then there's other things as well, such that most of the things I might want to discuss about my workings do not involve you, and most of the things I want to discuss about your workings don't involve me. I have a blood pressure, a temperature, a, a respiration rate, a certain amount of sugar in my blood, and numerous, thousands of state variables, millions actually, or I don't know how many, huge numbers of state variables in the physical sense, which represent me, the state of me as a particle. And you have gazillions of them as well. And most of mine are uncoupled to most of yours. So we can compute the properties of me without worrying too much about the properties of you. If we had to work about both of us together, then the number of states that we'd have to consider is the product of the number of states you have and the number of states I have. But this way, it's almost the sum. Now, indeed, there are forces that couple us. I'm talking to you and your state changes. I'm looking at you and my state changes. Some of my state variables, a very few of them, therefore, are coupled to yours. If you were to suddenly yell very loud, my blood pressure would go up. Okay. Say. However, and it may not be always appropriate to think about the world as being made out of independent states and independent particles. Lots of the bugs that occur in things like quantum mechanics, or the bugs in our minds that occur when we think about things like quantum mechanics, are due to the fact that we're trying to think about things being broken up into independent pieces, when in fact there is more coupling than we see on the surface, or that we want to believe in, because we want to compute efficiently and effectively. We've been trained to think that way. <clears throat> well, let's see. How would we know if we had objects at all? How can we tell if we have objects? Consider some possible optical illusions. This could be done. Okay. These pieces of chalk are not appropriately identical. But supposing you couldn't tell the difference of them by looking at them. Well, there's a possibility that this is all a game I'm playing with mirrors. It's really the same piece of chalk, but you're seeing two of them. How would you know if you're seeing one or two? Well, it's, there's only one way I know. You grab one of them and change it and see if the other one changed. And it didn't. So there's two of them. Okay. On the other hand, there's some other screwy properties of things like that. Like, how would we know if something changed? Well, we have to look at it before and after the change. The change is an assignment. It's this moment in time. But that means we have to know it was the same one that we're looking at. So some very strange and unusual and obscure and I don't understand problems associated with assignment and change and objects. I mean, these things get very, very bad. For example, here I am. I am a particular person, a particular object. Okay? Now I can take out my knife okay, and cut my fingernail. Right? And a piece of my fingernail has fallen off onto the table. I believe I am the same person I was a second ago. But I'm not physically the same in the slightest. Okay? I have changed. Why am I the same? What is the identity of me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Except for the fact that I have, I have some sort of identity. And so I think by introducing assignment and objects, we have, we have opened ourselves up to all of the horrible questions of philosophy that have been flagging philosophers for some thousands of years about this sort of thing. That's why mathematics is a lot cleaner. Let's look at the best things I know to say about actions and identity. We say that an action A had an effect on an object X, or equivalently, that X was changed by A if some property P which was true of X before A became false of X after A. That's a test. But it still means I have to have the X before and after. Or the other way of saying this is, we say that two objects, x and y, are the same. If any action which has an effect on x has the same effect on y. However, objects are very useful, as I said, for an intellectual economy. 
One of the things that's incredibly useful about them is that the world is, we like to think about, made out of independent objects with independent local state. We like to think that way, although it isn't completely true. Okay. When we want to make very complicated programs that deal with such a world, if we want those programs to be understandable by us and also to be changeable, so that if we change the world, we change the program only a little bit, then we want there to be connections, isomorphism, between the objects in the world and the objects in our mental model. The modularity of the world can give us a modularity in our programming. So we invent things called object-oriented programming and things like that to provide us with that, idea, to provide us with that power. But it's even easier. Let's play a little game. I want to play a little game showing you an even easier example of where modularity can be enhanced by using an assignment statement judiciously. One thing I want to enforce and impress on you is don't use assignment statements the way you use it in Fortran or BASIC or something or Pascal to do the things you don't have to do with it. It's not the right way to think for most things. Sometimes it's essential, or maybe it's essential. We'll see more about that, too. OK, well, let me show you a, a fun game here. Um, there was a mathematician by the name of Cesaro, or Cesaro, Cesaro, I suppose it is, uh, who figured out a clever way of computing pi. It turns out that if I take two random numbers, two integers at random, and compute their greatest common divisor, their greatest common divisor is either one or it's not one. If it's one, that they have no common divisors. Hmm? If, their, if their greatest common divisor is one, well, the probability that two random numbers, two numbers chosen at random, has greatest common divisor one is related to pi. Okay? In fact, yes, it's very strange. Of course, there are other ways of computing pi, like dropping pins on, on flags and things like that. It's sort of the same kind of thing. <clears throat> so the probability that the GCD of number one and number two, two random numbers chosen, is 6 over pi squared. I'm not going to try to prove that. It's actually not too hard. It's sort of fun. How would we estimate such a probability? Well, the way we do that, the way we estimate probabilities, is by doing lots of experiments and then computing the ratios of the ones that come out one way to the total number of experiments we do. It's called Monte Carlo. And it's useful in other contexts for doing things like integrals where you have lots and lots of variables. You have space with many dimensions you're doing an integral in. But going back to here, um, Let's look at this slide. Okay. We can use Cesaro's method for estimating pi with, an, with n trials by taking the square root of 6 over a Monte, Carlo, a Monte Carlo experiment with n, n trials using Cesaro's experiment. Where Cesaro's experiment is the test of whether the GCD of two random numbers and you can see that I've already got some assignments in here just by what I wrote. The fact that this word rand in parentheses, therefore that procedure call, yields a different value than this one, at least and that's what I'm assuming by writing this this way, indicates that this is not a function, that there's internal state in it, which is changing. But the, it's the probability, sorry, the GCD, the, if the GCD of those two random numbers is equal to 1, that's the experiment. So here I have an experimental method for estimating the value of pi, where I can easily divide this problem into two parts. One is the specific Monte, uh, Monte Carlo experiment of Cesaro, which you just saw, and the other is the general technique of doing Monte Carlo experiments. And that's what this is. If I want to do Monte Carlo experiments with n trials, a certain number of trials, and a particular experiment, and the way I do that is I make a little iterative procedure which has variables, the number of trials remaining and the number of trials that have been passed, that have gotten true. And if the number remaining is 0, then the answer is the number passed divided by the total number of trials, which is the estimate of the probability. And if, it's not, if, if I have more trials to do, then let's do one. We do an experiment. We call 
the procedure, which is the experiment on no arguments. We do the experiment, and then if that turned out to be true, we go around the loop, decrementing the number of experiments we have to do by one, and incrementing the number that were passed. And if the experiment was false, we just go around the loop, decrementing the number of experiments remaining, and keeping the number passed the same. We start this up, iterating over the total number of trials with zero experiments passed. A very elegant little program. And I don't have to just do this with Cesaro's experiment. It could be lots of Monte Carlo experiments I might do. Of course, this depends upon the existence of some sort of random number generator. And random number generators are generally look something like this. Okay. There is a, a random number generator is, in fact, a procedure which is going to do something just like the counter. It's going to update an x to a re, uh, the result of applying some function to x, where this function is some screwy kind of function that you might find out in Knuth's books on the details of programming. Knuth has these wonderful books that are full of the details of programming, because I can't remember how to make a random number generator. But I can look it up there, and I can find out. And then eventually, I return the value of x, which is the state variable internal to the random number generator. That state variable is initialized somehow and has a value. And this procedure is defined in the context where that, that variable is bound. So this is a hidden piece of local state that you see here. And this procedure is, in, is defined in that context. Now, that's a very simple thing to do. That's very nice. Supposing I didn't want to use assignments. Supposing I wanted to write this program without assignments. What problems would I have? Well, let's see. I'd like to use the overhead machine here. Thank you. Here's a, well, first of all, let's look at the whole thing. It's a big story, right? Unfortunately, which tells you there's something wrong. Okay. It's at least that big. And it's monolithic. I mean, you don't, you don't have to understand or look at the, the text there right now to see that it's monolithic. There isn't a thing which is Cesaro's experiment. It's not pulled out from the Monte Carlo process. It's not separated. Let's look why. Remember the constraint here is that every procedure return the same value for the same arguments. Every procedure represents a function. Okay. That's a different kind of constraint is when I have assignments, I can change some internal state variable. So let's see how that causes things to go wrong. Well, let's start at the beginning. Ah, the estimate of pi it looks sort of the same. Okay. What I'm doing is I take the square root of 6 over the random GCD test applied to n, whereas that's what this is. But here, we're beginning to see something funny. The random GCD test of a certain number of trials is just like we had before, the, an iteration on the number of trials remaining, the number of trials that have been passed, okay, and another variable x. What's that x? That x is the state of the random number generator. And it is now going to be used here. The same random update function that I have over here is the one I would have used in the random number generator if I were building it the other way, the one I get out of Knuth's books. Okay. x is going to get transformed into x1. I need two random numbers. And x1 is going to get transformed into x2. I have two random numbers. I then have to do exactly what I did before. I take the GCD of x1 and x2. If that's 1, then I go around the loop with x2 being the next value of x. You see what's happened here is that the state of the random number generator is no longer confined to the insides of the random number generator. It has leaked out. It has leaked out into my procedure that does, that does the, the Monte Carlo experiment. But what's worse than that is it's also, because it was contained inside my experiment itself, Cesaro, it leaked out of that, too, because Cesaro called twice. 
has to have a different value each time if I'm having a legitimate experimental test. So Cesaro can't be a function either. Okay. Unless I pass it the seed of the random number generator that's going to go wandering around. So unfortunately, the seed of the random number generator has leaked out into Cesaro from the random number generator. That's leaked into the Monte Carlo experiment. And unfortunately, Monte, my Monte Carlo experiment here is no longer general. The Monte Carlo experiment here knows how many random numbers I need to do the experiment. That's sort of horrible. I've lost an ability to decompose the problem into pieces because I wasn't willing to accept the, the little loop of information, the, the feedback process that happens inside the random number generator before that was made by having, by having an assignment to a state variable that was confined to the random number generator. So there, the fact that the random number generator is an object with an internal state variable, it's affected by nothing, but it'll give you something. It applies force to you. Okay. That was what we're missing now. OK. Well, I think we've seen enough reason for doing this. And it all sort of looks very wonderful. Wouldn't it be nice if, if assignment was a good thing? And maybe it's worth it. But I'm not sure. As Mr. Gilbert and Sullivan said, things are seldom what they seem. Skim milk masquerades as cream. Are there any questions? Are there any philosophers here? Anybody want to argue about objects? You're just floored, right? And you haven't done your homework yet. You haven't come up with a good question. <laughs> oh, well. Hey. Oh, sure. Thank you. Let's take the long break now. <laughs>